Daniel Abram, President of the Whitley Historical Society. I'm pleased to welcome you to this talk, which is jointly sponsored by the Whitley Historical Society and the Whitley 250th. Um, so, uh, in a moment, I will have Judy Markland, who is curator of the new exhibit that is available in our museum downstairs, which we hope you will visit. And I turn this program over now to Judy Marklin to say a few words about the exhibit and to introduce uh, our speaker. It's news to me I'm talking about the exhibits. That part will be very short. It's called Becoming Whately a History and Objects. And we tried to focus on objects that talked about Waitley history that not everybody knew about. I mean, there are some everybody knows about, pottery, tobacco, but a lot that maybe you don't. And so I encourage you to go down and see. You can skim through, but it takes a while if you want to really enjoy all the display photo boxes that we got courtesy of the Massachusetts and Waitley Cultural Council, for which we're very grateful. Um, well pollution, broom corn, potato chips, um, ropes, ink, things maybe you don't associate with them, so come and spend some time. But my real chore here, my pleasure here tonight, is to introduce Peter Thomas. Um, I read once that one of the three characteristics of genius is the ability to apply the concepts from one discipline to another to another discipline. And when I look at Pete's background, he incorporates more disciplines than almost anybody ever met. His undergraduate degree from UMass is in American history. His master's and PhD were in anthropology, again at UMass. He got himself up to UVM. He founded the, I get this right, the Cultural Resource Consulting Archaeology, Archaeology Resource Program. Archaeology now, in addition to anthropology and history, and directed over 200 excavations while he's being assistant professor of anthropology there. And somehow he spent, figured out time to learn about geology which I'm not quite sure how he squeezed into that, but he did. Um, he then decided to leave academia and apply this in real world, world terms to a career with FEMA as environmental and historic preservation officer, which is a pretty challenging way to apply those disciplines. And now supposedly he's in quasi-retirement in South Deerfield. <laughs> Well, um, he's writing papers, he's giving talks, he's doing research on early congregational churches. I don't know how many of you have found the photos of Wheatley's congregational church, early church records on our website, but we have Pete Thomas to thank for taking all those photos. Um, He's working on exhibit for our archaeology, archaeology exhibit for Deerfield's 300th. And he's taken the time to spend a lot of time with people like me who want to learn about things. Um, he found out I was doing this exhibit. He helped me learn about Paleo-American peoples. He went with me to look at the artifacts hours with me and one thing he did was take this tray of little pieces of stone and turn it into the pretty exhibit or the meaningful exhibit that you'll see downstairs. He's going to take all these disciplines and put them together and talk about the geological, the climate impact, changing climate impact on the valley and on the peoples here. I've heard bits and pieces of it and I can't wait to hear the rest. 
Please join me in welcoming Peter Thomas. Formal woodlands. 
This is an open grassland with scattered trees around. So if we look a little closer, that's the glacial advance in Northern Europe. You can see Scandinavia here, England here, Ireland. Uh, and you get some glacial advance down in the Alps. In North America, that was the Laurentide Ice Covered all of Canada. We are right here. And you can see it extended much further south down into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and up into Alaska here. This is a huge ice mass. And at the time we're talking about, there's roughly a mile and a half of ice over us. Immensely. Well, what happens when you have glaciers? <coughs> Where's all that water come from? Where's all the ice come from? Comes out of the ocean. That was the coastline of North America, the United States, 20,000 years ago. Oh. Anybody vacation on the Cape? <laughs> Where was, where was the coastline relative to the Cape? 90 miles off the Massachusetts coast. And what happens is that the fisheries guys today with their drag nets keep dragging up mammoth teeth and mammoth tusks. So we know the stuff is out there. And we also know that archaeologically we're never going to get to understanding much of it because we're not good deep sea divers and we can't lay out a grid of the bottom of the floor. Um, nonetheless, the glaciers start to melt roughly 20,000 years ago. So we're going to talk about glacial recession in this, in this time frame. And it's within this time frame, or just right towards the end in, in this period, that we begin the first Native Americans coming into New England. Otherwise, it's got ice over it. And one of the things that's true for glacial recession is the ice melts first on the mountaintops and last in the valleys. And that makes sense because there's less ice on the tops of the mountains. Um, but that has a particular effect on what happens during glacial erosion. So here's a map. This is Long Island here. And this string of lines represents a hill, uh, or a series of hills, that form at the very end of the glacier. Glaciers pick up huge amounts of debris. They pluck off mountaintops and head all the way as the ice moves south. But when they stop advancing, and they start retreating, they dump that stuff. And so the Ronkonkoma moraine, and that's a moraine is what the glacier dumped, forms a string of hills that extend the length of Long Island. And it's from that point down here that the glacier starts to retreat north. And we're going to talk about Glacial Lake Hitchcock to a fair degree which extends from here in southern Connecticut, central Connecticut, and goes all the way up into northern Vermont. So about 200 miles long. But the point to I want to make, and I can show it with this particular graph, is that glacial melt did not occur as a continuum. It pulsed. And so what happens is you get dumping debris on Long Island, then it moves north, stagnates, advances, dumps a bunch of stuff more, retreats, stagnates, 
dumps a bunch of stuff, keeps on going up the valley. So the history of Lake Champlain at the southern end of it down here is not the history of Lake Champ or Glacial Lake Hitchcock up here. This is Wakey, so you want to get yourself relative. And these are two prominent moraines. So we know of at least two periods where it's, it's stagnated, dumped debris, created a moraine. When it did that, it blocked the flow of the river and it impounded behind it. That's, what going, that's what's going on down here. There's, or down here. There's a big moraine that went across here and a bedrock hill and they literally kept the water behind it. They acted as dams and the moraines acted as dams going further and further north. So I'm going to read you a little bit of the text just so I can keep myself organized here. So approximately 18,000 years ago, the Laurentide ice sheet had retreated as far north as New Britain and Rocky Hill in central Connecticut. As the ice margin retreated further northward up the Connecticut River, glacial meltwater was backed up in the Connecticut River Valley behind a bedrock ridge in New Britain and a sand and gravel deposit at Rocky Hill, causing the formation of Glacial Lake Hitchcock. As the glacier retreated northward along the course of the river, the lake also expanded northward eventually stretching all the way to northern Vermont. In the Pesumsek River Valley, the lake deposits extend as far north as Burke, and in the Connecticut River Valley, they extend up to the vicinity of Littleton, New Hampshire. Or somewhat younger lake deposits extend even farther north in the Connecticut River, in the Connecticut River Valley. Lake Hitchcock finally drained approximately 12,500 years ago. So let's have a little closer look. So here we are in Wakey. And here we Rocky Hill. And the Holyoke Range crosses right here. So this is what Lake Hitchcock looked like. He extended it. And then I'm showing ice here. So What's happening is, as this front melts, the lake gets further and further up the valley. So here we are over here in the Connecticut Valley, and uh, this is this is Vermont. So this is still Lake Hitchcock. That's what we're talking about. But I also wanted to give you a wider perspective. Because on the other side of the Green Mountains, here in the Champlain Valley, what happened is we have to shift over to here. When the glacier got north of the St. Lawrence River, which is coming in here, we have to consider the weight of ice. What do you think had happened to the Earth's crust when you had this much ice on it? It's like a basketball, you're right. And what happens is that when it gets north of the St. Lawrence River, or what's the St. Lawrence River today, the land was below sea level. So the Atlantic Ocean poured in up the St. Lawrence and formed a 20,000 square mile inland sea here. And Lake Champlain is here only in a small part of the Champlain Sea. And there were whales and seals and three-spined sticklebacks and everything you'd find in a marine environment in western Vermont. And not too far from here, between about 12,000 and 10,000 years ago. So at some point, things are looking like this. And how do we know this? And how do we know the chronology? Well, one thing that happens in a glacial lake is every year, through the seasons, the lake freezes and it falls. And when it falls, and there's no vegetation on the landscape, no trees, no nothing, just wide open, empty dirt. 
and it pours, or it snows, and it melts. All that runoff comes down into the lake, down every little stream, rill, everything else. And as a result, that material settles out the bottom of the lake, and it's fairly coarse. It's, it's silts and very fine sands. And then in the wintertime, lake freezes, there's no erosion, and the clay settles out over those months, the winter months. And they create what they call a barb. And a barb is simply that packet of coarse and fine, coarse, fine, coarse, fine, coarse, fine. It's sort of like when you uh, cut a tree and you look at the tree rings, that's sort of what you're looking at. You'll see in each ring a variation, a lighter, darker color. And that's what defines it. Well, people figured out, well, how, how old is this lake? How long was it around? Oh, Antetes back in 1928 said, huh, I can cut those bars. So he started finding bar deposits. Each one of these is a bar. And he'd find these exposures and he'd start counting. Well, there, there's variation in these bars in terms of the texture of the sediments and the thickness of them. And just as they do in tree ring dating, looking at the widths of tree rings, they start matching them up. So, just as an example, these are from Amherst bars, each one of these. And what's happened here is the uh, coarser material has eroded out, so that's why they're kind of prominent like this. Here's one. We well, see a series of bars, and then all of a sudden you get this humongous bunch of muck. You get inclusions. This was one horrendous storm, or some climatic or episode, weather episode, not a climate episode. This is a single year. Something was really moving sediments. Major, major storm. So what happens is, and the details aren't important, but each one of these is a bar is a bar bar exposure that's been found going up the valley. This is chicken down here, this is turnus falls up here. And basically by matching the sequence that's in here, all of these wind up, you can actually, this is the 3,500 3, bar, roughly, in the sequence, which continues all the way to the south, uh, up to, can't quite read it, but somewhere around 5,500. So we've got several thousand bars, sequences, between here and Turnus Falls. <coughs> That's, that's talking about the length of the lake that the lake's been here. It's taken a couple thousand years of build up in that lake. So we know it was here that, that stable, for that stable period. So the, the entire sequence that runs sequence there are 5,659 bars. So there's your chronology uh, on the landscape. Well let's see what happens. What's going to happen in that changing landscape? Well initially when all of this is going on and the lake is draining particularly down here The lake drains. And it starts to transform the lake, the lake bottom landscape. 
So in this particular picture, the equivalent would be that's along Long Plain Road. That was the lake bottom. And in a relatively short period of time, the river rushing out of the glacier up valley has eroded from there to here. And only eventually is that river captured into a single channel. And we'll come back to that, but that's, that's the process of how it gets deeper briefly. Well, what's going on? Well, at this point in time, we have a mastodon remains from Ivory Pond in the Berkshires with a rate of carbon date of 11,885 years ago. So these beasts are roaming the landscape. And caribou, huge, huge herds of caribou are wintering south into New York and then following up through the north hundreds of miles to their summer breeding grounds just at the, at the southern edge of the, of the glaciers that are retreating. So this is a, a process that occurred over several thousands of years. Is every year those herds of caribou would move north. And they left behind a whole assemblage of stone tools. These are what are called, these would be the assemblage of tools you might find it, what we call a Paleo-Indian site. Paleo simply meaning old. This is what the archaeologists began to call the first people, first Native Americans uh, on the continent. And they're very distinctive. The workmanship is exceedingly high. It takes a lot of effort to be able to flake each one of these tools and not break it, sometimes not successfully. And these were picked up in your backyard. And they're on the exhibit downstairs. These are Paleo-Indian artifacts. <coughs> Characteristic, flute, what do you call a fluted point? Is it a concave base, but they moved a flake that was struck here and went all the way up to here and all the way down here. And these are some small scraping tools for processing hides or wood, a cutting knife. These are blanks, making tools. And this raw material, the particular material they're using, it's a, what we call a chert. Uh, it's like flint, slightly different. But um, it's probably out of the Hudson Valley in New York. Uh, there's some big quarries uh, along the Hudson River that extends all the way north into Vermont. And we have material in Vermont where I spent a lot of time that looks much like this as well. But the types of raw materials that show up at Paleo-Indian sites are really varied. They extend anywhere from down here in southern Pennsylvania to northern Maine. And these are just some of the hundreds of Paleo-Indian sites that we and I don't know about today. Um, this is Waitley here. Uh, this is north of us going up all the way up on something. Each one of these areas has a known quarry associated with it. So on an un on a vege unvegetated landscape, the, the bedrock is much more visible. So when people are trekking north, hunting caribou, they spot these rare minerals, uh, or mostly chirps and felsites, uh, and they remember where they are, and they go back and get them. One of the things we're unclear about is whether a lot of this is not picked up on an annual uh, following the herds of caribou, seems like an awful long way, or maybe there are parties that know where some of this is and one of their strategies is to go and extract this material that everybody wants and then trade it for caribou. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure. One of the other things that's interesting is that there are clusters of Paleo-Indian sites. 
around what we call dune fields. Now one of these is in your own backyard. But here's a map of, we know at least of these clusters. All of these are famous paleo Indian sites. Here, right here. On the Allen Sanderson Farm, on Sanderson Farm, that's where the artifacts came from that you just saw here. And dune fields look like this. This is what that part of Waitley, Canterbury, might have looked like 12,500 years ago. <clears throat> and one way that we can surmise that, so what do, what do you have here? You have a sand dune, here it is, a, if you fit on the cape, but you, see, you can see all the sand dunes around. This sand dune, you can see it here. And the beds are draping from high to low here. They're, they're taped this way. This is on the Sanderson farm. Birds are having a good time building their nests in here. But this is a relic, um, sufficient geology, Landform from roughly 11,000 years ago. And the sun's a little coming in on us, but this is the area that I'm talking about at Waitley, is Mount Sugarloaf. Uh, this is uh, Sugarloaf Brook coming down through here and then goes into the Connecticut River. But you see these rises. All of those are dunes. There's been, there's been a lot of uh, soil removal, leveling of ground out there for agricultural purposes. Uh, but the relic dunes still remain. Now, one of the things I wanted to emphasize or have a closer look at is temperature change, annual average temperatures. So, So these are thousands of years ago, here. This is the Pleistocene that we talked about with the glaciers. This is, there was a period when it got really warm towards the end of that glacial period and then went into another thousand year dip back to the way it was. And nobody's quite sure why. And then it gets progressively warmer, sharply, and by 11,000 years ago, it's then gotten progressively warmer. But I want to emphasize that, you see the dips and troughs up in here? They don't look like too much when you compare these kinds of things. But I will show you another graph where that becomes really significant. But anyway, we've gone from a really cold to a really fairly warm environment. And we know this because of the ice cores in Greenland and Iceland. Every year it snows and creates a different layer in the glaciers in Greenland. And depending upon the amount of oxygen that's in that snow belt, it will tell you the temperature range that it was placed in, that, that, that that particular layer of ice was deposited. You've seen times when we have a mild winter, the only thing we get is you know, little thin beds of stuff, and then we go look at grandma's photo album and somebody's standing there with a snow pile like this. Well, it's the same thing progressively in the glacier. But then what happens is that snowpack gets compressed into actually solid ice. And they go in and take cores and then they read up the cores and can tell you what's going on. So now we're going to jump, we're going to start about 11.7 and do some jumping. But I, I want to um, show you a couple of things. We talked about 
the early coast being 90 miles off the coast. Well, this is a sequence, and the oldest part of the sequence, the oldest time frame is here. This is Boston. There's a little peninsula that sticks out that was once Boston. You'd never recognize it today because there's so much fill that had gone out of Boston. All the back bays been filled. Uh, it's been filled along the front too with all the piers and everything else. But here's the coast. And this is the coast today, okay? Massachusetts Bay. So that's 9,000. <clears throat> 6,000, it's coming in. And somehow Boston slipped from here to here. Uh, I ended in the slide, but that's where Boston is. And this was 3,000 years ago. So only within the past 3,000 years has the landform existed that Boston was found when the settlers first came here. And what they found when they, after they got through filling, they wanted to build the Hancock building which is in tilled land. So they dug down, and what they were finding was fish weirs that had been left behind in the marshes behind the peninsula. So here's a, here's a, a graph that I kind of like. It's a little difficult to read, but look at the black line. That that's averages all the other, all, all of these represent different sources of information. But average together, this is basically coming out of Pleistocene into what we call the Holocene, the, the non-ice part. Uh, and this, these are the 10,000 years, these are the 1,000 year intervals. So here's us today. We're over here. This is the average overall. If we took all of these ups and downs, that's what it would average up to. So we're essentially on a cooler climate than these guys. And what I want you to observe is the difference in degrees centigrade. Is these, this is a half a degree. This is one degree, okay? Now think about all you hear on the climate change and what the goal is to reduce climate emissions so we can reduce the annual average temperature two degrees centigrade. Two degrees centigrade is from here to here. Higher than anything that existed here. And what I will tell you is that we're here. This is what's called the hypsothermal, the, the warmest part of the past, between about 5,000 years ago, 4,500, and about 7,500 years ago. That's the warmest period in the past. It was hot and it was dry. The Forest vegetation, which had been firmly established by that time in the valleys, is all the way up the mountains. But it was warm enough over that, over that 3,000 year period, the lowland species to get to the tops of the highest mountains of the Green Mountains and the White Mountains. It was dry enough to drop the water table 15 feet in inland ponds and bogs. Some of them dried up entirely. Where we are in the valley right now, how many frost-free days have we got? Anybody know? Somewhere around 280, something like that. Back then, we would have had a frost-free environment of roughly 320 days, like Georgia. And that's only less than one degree difference in terms of annual average temperatures. A little bit higher than that. So here's your, in a nutshell, frigid and dry, back to the Pleistocene, 
early Holocene poor moist. Middle Holocene hits the very hot dry and cooler moist. And variations all the way through there. So if we go just go back, that's the little ice age, and that's where we are today. And there's less than uh, 20, a quarter of one degree centigrade average makes that difference. Yeah. Well, there we go. So I'm not going to spend any time with woodlands, but we're basically going from an environment once the glacier um, melts to something that looked like this. This is in Alaska to vegetation, spotted trees, lots of wetlands. The great swamp in Waitley down here is a relic of one of these types of ponds that form on the lake bottom, the bottom of Lake or Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Then the denser vegetation to mix, and then you've got the, the deciduous coniferous forest now. So let's go to Canterbury. And I can show you in a little minute, more focused way, what happens. So here's the industrial park. Everybody got a pretty good sense of Wheatley. I mean, if I'm down a river road and walk by the road, you know where I am. Okay. So here's the industrial park. Long Plain Road is here. And if you go down to the, the, the uh, agricultural fields, you'll run into an escarpment, a, a drop off that's maybe 10 feet higher than this room. And it starts here and goes all the way down here. And then if you get down to a half, uh, half field, there's another one that starts there and goes all the way down to half. Uh, this is called Hopewell Swamp today, but what it was, was a channel of one of those braided river, river systems in the Connecticut that was cutting into this lake, glacial lake bottom. And then the channel shifted and it got left behind. But we have a 9,300 year old date from organic material at the bottom of this swamp. So we know that at that point, the river system had already shifted away <coughs> from that bank and wetland vegetation was growing in it. So it's at least, it's got to be older than 9,300 years. This is, right here, is the bottom of, yeah, thank you. Right here is the lake water. And if we were to think about where we're sitting, it's up here. That's where the top of the lake was. But this was the bottom of the lake. So when you go down um, Christian Lane, you get to the bottom of this hill and you turn into the, where the steam uh, engine uh, exhibits are. You walk, look out behind that steam, that place absolutely flat. There's a stream that's cut in on, on the right hand, left hand side, but that land is flat, and that's what the land was like at the bottom of Lake Hitchcock. And then here is where that river channel that I just showed you, this one right here, that's where that is, and that's where the bottom is, and that's where the Connecticut River is today. So what you wind up getting is a braided system that's going all the way across this valley. If you're standing over here, when you get through, you walk behind Town Hall to the point where you can look to the east. You're going to be standing just above a beach for Glacial Lake Hitchcock. It goes comes off of here, goes down, levels out, and then drops. And that slope is continuous all the way down to the flat land at the bottom. 
that was Lake Hitchcock. Hitchcock. And look across the valley and you'll see the towers from UVM or UMass. That's the other side of Lake Hitchcock. It, it's pretty impressive when you get out there and you actually look at this. It's one thing to look at something on the map and say, yeah, okay, that's pretty good side. And you get out and there, my goodness gracious, that's miles and miles over there. And this thing went for 200 miles south to north. So we're going to back step, we're going to go from relic channels and we'll, we'll reproduce this using a series of slides I took in Alaska. I took the next picture from here looking this way. This is an active glacier coming down the Matanuska River Valley out of the mountains to the south. <coughs> and the water is flowing down this way. And if you can see it up close, you'd see this huge debris field right here. All the stuff, the junk that it's carrying in the ice. And then we're gonna look at it going down the river. So, let's look at the next one. I think you skipped one, but that's all right. So, let me try something. Oh, there we go, okay. So, here's the glacier that's coming out of the mountains over here. It's flowing down, all of this junk that you see here, that's all debris. This would form a moraine if, if left there. <coughs> it's not, it's gonna to continue to melt right on the back up here. But what's happening is when this glacier was back up in here, it was putting a lot of melt water down into the sediments that were down here in the valley bottom. And There. So this was the top of the sediments. Uh, right here, you can see the trees on the top of them. And the river has down cut through these sediments about 100 feet. And that's what happens with the industrial park and the river here. It's cutting down. So you'll find these escarpments on the other side of the valley too. You know where Warner Brothers old gravel pit was? That's part of that sequence on the other side of the valley. And so you can see the sandy deposits. Oops. Sandy deposits here, and it's down cut. But look at this river. It's not a single channel river. It's multi-channel. And every year, these channels will shift. But they go from one side of the valley to the other. And that's what was happening in the Connecticut Valley. And you can see, here's a topo map with the same kind of pattern. You can see those channels. Here is beginning to consolidate. You don't see as many separate channels there. You're getting into one or two, and at some point, this channel may actually capture most of it. That's what it looks like from an aerial point of view. But I thought what I would do, this is Alaska, this is us. Here's that escarpment, here's that escarpment. So you get a sense, I mean, you can shift it back now if you would. But at some point, all the land, keep on going, uh, I want this one. All of this that you saw over here would have extended across the river in Sutherland. And part of that would have been there too. It's just that the curve of this river tends to, the bigger curve tends to be in this direction. And what happens in rivers like that is the outside bend is the cutting bend. So it's moving in the direction of the bow, it's moving that way. And the same thing is true in the opposite direction. So bend of the river is that way. So a lot of Sutherland has been covered by later flood deposits and is obscure the pattern that we see on the Wheatley side. And just to reinforce it, this is Canterbury, New Zealand. <laughs> and the river coming out of the Southern Alps. 
But there's, there's your braided room. And eventually, you get something like this. So one last cross section that I've gone across the valley, uh, Wheatley's over here, along this line, that's what the topography looks like. And it kind of looks like this. Like you've got Great Swamp here, up, up here. You've got the dunes. You've got the old Hatfield Trail. This is the Pocumpe Trail. The Hatfield Trail that goes from South Deerfield down Long Plain Road. The Sugarloaf site, um, basically that's where the industrial park is. Here's the old river channel that's now Hopewell Swamp. You get a series of terraces along the river. And the last one uh, is where your baseball field is down there. That park, you know, when you come off a river road, you all of a sudden get out. That's the last and the youngest terrace. You also see that the channel, the present channel of the river has moved from here to here through time. Over the last 7,500 years, it's been moving in that direction. So, I'd invite you to just go take a car, go, go for a drive. Think about where these things are. And, Judy, do you still have that article that I wrote? Uh, maybe you can make it available to people that want to read it. I've, I've summarized some of this material, but these maps are drawn from an article I wrote on uh, a year or two ago. It's on our website. Is it on the website? Yeah. Check it out if you want a reference for it. But these, these will help you when you get down the road, you can kind of look out and say, oh yeah, that's what Terrence was talking about. And see if you can identify it. If the light wasn't on, we could probably see it. But here you can see, you can make out the various terraces. You see some here, see some here, see some here, and right down by the river. Well, that's the landscape change. This is the place. And through that entire period of what we just visited, from glaciers having melted, leaving a lake bottom, paleo Indian occupation of the industrial park, Native American communities have used the valley, but in substantially different ways. Early on, the following caribou. They're in one spot for a day or two, or if they've got a base camp set up to process hides or process the meat, they may be there for a few weeks and then move on. And remember that some of them pretty short back then. This is a glacial period. Uh, winds are blowing from the south, but then they hit the glaciers that are melting to the north and they whip around and you get the 60, 60 mile an hour winds coming out of the northeast off the, off the glacial front. Not real pleasant sunbathing weather. <laughs> so several thousand years approximately that way. Um, that's pretty much what's represented here. Then people began by 7,500, the more or less the mature forests have come in. The river is still incising, it's still moving around. But small bands of people, family bands, small band communities settle in near or adjacent to high resource areas. The best one I know of turn is Turner's Falls, the fisheries in the spring. Thousands, if not millions, of salmon and shad come up, came up the Connecticut River. And people know people knew that and could plan that okay from early March, early May, late April to the summer of June, end of June, those fish will be running in great numbers. So they can set up their camps there. You can also dry that fish, which means that you can have a more extended occupation. Um, 
one of the things from archaeological deposits at Turnus Falls uh, is you get a real variety of things being eaten. Not only is the, is the fish there, but you get turtle and rattlesnake. Uh, bones getting left behind. People were collecting those and eating those too. This was a, a, a time when food food was an important what I really was. <laughs> you, know, you, you gotta eat. And if 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 the fish are slowing down, eat whatever else is available. And then it comes a point in time of the year when that environment is not will not sustain a larger group of people. And so the community breaks up and maybe goes to several different ponds. They go into the Berkshires for hunting. They come back to the lowlands in the wintertime where it's warmer. And eventually you get corn, bean, squash agriculture that has a huge impact on communities. This is roughly 900 years ago. AD 1100, about the time the Vikings were raising hell in Europe. That's when corn, bean, squash agriculture comes in. And that does one critical thing, and that is provides food for what was formerly starving time, that dead winter. And when you look at the Abnaki calendar for the Connecticut Valley, what you find is that four of those months are related to agriculture. It's sort of like, you know, when the salmon or shad blossom comes in, it's a name for one of the lunar, 13 lunar months. But that's important, it recognizes the fish. But then there's the planting time. <coughs> and then there's the harvest time. And then there's the in-between time. I mean, you're not eating corn, but you're storing it away. Then comes the fall hunt. The village breaks up. They're going into the Berkshires. We have records of um, men here in the valley hunting and trapping in the fall that are in the St. Lawrence Valley. that are going over the mountains into the Hudson. So these people are moving in very broad areas. And it's only when January comes that they come back to the village and they know they've got a supply of corn beans and squash that they've dried and hidden in um, these sort of bell-shaped pits that are actually dug into the ground, narrow like this, and then they bell out. And you can actually stand on that piece over the bell, but you can put baskets of preserved food in there, and then you cap them off with two feet of dirt. And what it does is create a stable environment in terms of humidity and temperature. And that allows them to store that grain over the winter time. And then comes spring, you leave in the village and you're down in the falls. So it's the environment, well it doesn't dictate exactly what you have to do. It's that accommodation that people always do or have to do is balance the cultural patterns of the communities with the environmental patterns that are going on. And that's something we're sort of faced with today. So if you look over time, cultural patterns, mostly what archaeologists deal with is artifacts. So that's the kind of a chronology of artifacts from Paleo-Indian fluted points bifurcate base, and I won't bore you with the rest of all these names, they've all been labeled. But they're all, what happens with artifacts, and we see it in our own culture, is that the styles change. And for us, styles tend to change very rapidly. A 1940 Studebaker doesn't look like a 1950 Studebaker, and I don't think one existed in 1960. But you get the point, is that and what we find is that these are not um, just in one small area. These styles of points extend over a thousand miles in East and North America. Mm -hmm. So people are interacting with one another as well. And then, 
These are changes in types of pottery uh, or containers for cooking. So these are soapstone bowls actually carved out of soapstone. Uh, here in the valley, there's some of them um, were found around Long Meadow. They're actually in huge glacial erratics. And what they do to make this form is they chisel in a channel in the shape that they want into the bed, into the bedrock, into the bowl. And when they got it in deep enough, they get in behind with wedges and break it off. And then they hollow out the bowl and what they've got. Well, that was replaced by pottery uh, around 3,000 years ago. Uh, conical vessels stayed that way until corn agriculture comes in. And it's usually simmered in a pot, so a rounded bottom distributes the heat better than a conical bottom. So the vessels change from things that look like this the vessels that look like this. This was up in Turnus Falls. I just wanted to give you an example of what some of the sites might look like. This is down two and a half feet in Riverside. This is Gill. This is across the, on the Gill side of the Turnus Falls, on the Gill side of the dam, so that little community of the Riverside. And uh, back in the 70s, and I put in a few some test bits there. This is what's left of a cooking pit. But the sequences from the surface on down, let, this level was probably about 7,500 years ago. And every spring, this area was reoccupied with the fisheries, and the soil was coal black from all the organic remains left behind from processing fish and stuff. And it's about that deep. Um, and we have good radiocarbon dates for that entire sequence. The oldest one I have is 8,690 um, for the occupations of Riverside. So, I could spend a lot more time dealing with that, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll end here and the people that are